People often ask me how I got involved and what I've been doing for the last 13 years. It goes back, really, um, to 1973. In November 1973, I found myself in Paris at a Congress of French-speaking evangelical leaders, which obviously I'm not. My French is very poor. I can understand what goes on at such a place. I didn't know why I was there. I only knew that God wanted me there. And over lunch one day, I met a young man who also didn't know why he was there, but knew that God wanted him there, and apparently we were there to meet one another. He was an Indian, and I, of course, asked him, how did you become a Christian, and what are you doing at such a place as this? And he began to tell me this incredible story. He had been a young guru, uh, a, a Hindu guru, and had come to Christ. And uh, it was amazing. At that time, Francis Schaeffer was encouraging Ravi Maharaj to write a polemic against Hinduism, and I suggested to him, I don't think uh, too many people will read that sort of a book, but what you ought to do is tell your story to the world. It's so fantastic, and uh, it would communicate. I had no idea that I would be helping him write his story. We ran into one another a year later at the World Congress on Evangelization in uh, Lausanne, Switzerland, and uh, eventually I helped Robbie write his story. It was called Death of a Guru, and many, many people have come to Christ. Many Hindus have come to Christ through reading that. That led, one thing led to another. I went to India to write another book, and uh, the story of a Hindu who came to Christ in his little village. Then I began to see connections between the drug movement in the United States, uh, parapsychology, psychic phenomena, the whole cult explosion. And uh, out of that came another book, which is the first in a series of four now. I've written a number of other books, but four of them go together. Uh, the first one was The Cult Explosion, which was a new look at the cults in the context of biblical prophecy, because I believe that the time that Jesus said just prior to his return would be characterized by the greatest deception that the world has ever seen. That was followed by a sequel, Peace, Prosperity, and the Coming Holocaust. And what we attempted to document in this book was that there's something a lot larger and more dangerous than the cults called the New Age Movement. And you say, larger? Yes, much larger. Uh, tens of millions of people in America, hundreds of millions around the world, as opposed to the few millions that are involved in any given cult. This is the largest. More dangerous? Yes. Everybody would recognize the Hare Krishnas in their saffron robes and shaven heads dancing on the streets of New York or wherever. You would recognize them for who they are, but not too many people recognize New Age teaching when it comes clothed in perhaps the latest theology, the latest psychology, uh, the latest health science. And that was followed by a book that turned out to be very controversial. I did not expect it to be. It surprised me, uh, called The Seduction of Christianity. Because what we tried to show in The Seduction of Christianity was that there's the New Age movement is larger and more dangerous than we thought it was. It, in fact, has come inside the Church of Jesus Christ. Because of the great interest that that book aroused, uh, that has been followed now with a sequel, which is the fourth in this series, Beyond Seduction, and the subtitle of this one is A Return to Biblical Christianity. I'm very concerned about what's been happening out there. I never expected to be writing a critique of some of the doctrinal teachings of some of our Christian leaders that came about only after much prayer and heart searching and concern because I saw that what was the deception that was in the world around us had in fact influenced and penetrated the church of Jesus Christ. People sometimes say, well, what kind of training do you have? You don't have a theological degree and uh, how do you qualify to do something like this? Well, first of all, I'm a Berean, and the Bereans were apparently qualified and commended for checking out what Paul uh, said against the scriptures that they had in their day. My background, of course, is not theological, although I have been studying the Word of God on my knees for over 40 years. But I come out of a business background. I majored in mathematics at UCLA as pre-law. I never finished my law studies because in the midst of them I had to take over the management of a number of corporations. I'm a certified public accountant. I was studying that on the side. 
at the same time I was going to university. And by, I only say that to say that by uh, training, by education, and by profession, I am accustomed to carefully examine evidence and to arrive at a conclusion to which I would sign my name. And that is what we have tried to do in these books, and I hope that God will use this to his glory. Let's open our Bibles to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. Let's start back at the beginning. You know, if there's anything that we want to do in this series, it's to challenge you to think for yourself and to get to know the Bible for yourself. And that means you've got to know the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. How would you know whether I'm not deceiving you? If you don't know the Bible, how do you know whether what I'm saying agrees with the Bible or whether someone else, what they're saying is according to Scripture? You have to know the Word of God for yourself. I don't know whether you're familiar with the poem. It goes something like this. Yes, I thought I knew my Bible, reading piecemeal, hit or miss, and now a verse in Job or Proverbs, now a bit of Genesis, certain chapters of Isaiah, certain Psalms, the 23rd, 12th of Romans, 1st of Proverbs. Yes, I thought I knew the word. But I found that thorough reading was a different thing to do, and the way was unfamiliar when I read my Bible through. You who like to play at Bible, dip and dabble here and there, just before you kneel a weary and yawn through a hurried prayer, you who treat the crown of writings as you treat no other book, just a paragraph disjointed, just a crude, impatient look, try a worthier procedure. Try a broad and steady view. You will bow in very wonder when you read the Bible through and through and through for yourself again and again to study the Word of God on your knees. That's why we want to begin at the beginning. And let's go back to this verse, <clears throat> Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, obviously, this is not the beginning for God, but it's the beginning for the universe. God had no beginning, of course. You don't get life and intelligence springing spontaneously from dead, empty space. There had to be a creator who always existed in order to bring the creation into existence. And that there was a beginning to the universe, we know very simply, because, for example, the sun has not been up in the sky forever. If it had been up in the sky forever, it would have burned out by now, right? Or it would have been infinite to begin with. If it was infinite to begin with, it would still be infinite because you can't exhaust infinity. So we know that there was a time when the sun was not there, when the stars were not there, when this universe was not here. And that's what it's talking about. God created the universe. I think it was Theodore Rozak, who is not a Christian by any means, who said that evolution, the theory of Darwin, did away with this incredible God. Yes, the God of the Bible, the real God, the true God, the creator of the universe, obviously is incredible because he's beyond our ability to comprehend. And, and I sometimes say, Lord, you expect a lot out of me. You expect me to believe that you've had, you have no beginning, no end, that you know every thought that every human being who has ever lived or ever will live has ever thought or ever will think, that you know where every subatomic particle in every atom has ever been or ever will be. I mean, that's incredible. Theodore Rozak says the theory of Darwin replaced, got rid of this incredible God and replaced him with even a more incredible God, the great God Chance. You don't get an Encyclopedia Britannica out of an explosion in a print shop. You're not just a bunch of blobs of protoplasm sitting there on these seats, I hope, uh, pieces of educated beefsteak with nerves, and the very words that I'm saying um, are just the result of the antecedent motions of the atoms in my brain. 
which all began with a big bang 18 billion years ago, and it's just been going on ever since. Everybody knows that's not true, and everybody knows that God exists. And the Bible doesn't even argue the existence of God. It simply begins with God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the heavens declare the glory of God, Psalm 19 tells us. The firmament shows his handiwork. And Romans chapter 1 tells us that every human being knows that God exists. They know this in their heart. They know this in their conscience. They know this because the universe itself bears witness to God. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And then we don't have time to go into the details, but you'll notice in verse 4, verse 10, verse 12, verse 18, 21, and 25, and so forth, you have a phrase there, God saw that it was good. God saw that it was good. He created a good universe. Why does it say over and over that God saw that it was good? Because only God can decide what's good. You can't. You can't go by your standard. I can't go by my standard. If you have somehow within you the ability to say what's good and decide what is good and what is bad, then somebody else decides and somebody else decides we've got chaos. Someone has to decide what is good and what is, is, is evil, and God alone can decide. And so God said it was good. I was some time ago visiting in a World's Fair, and the United Nations had a pavilion there. And when you walked into the pavilion, it was telling you of all of the problems in the world, ecological problems, we're trembling under a nuclear sword of Damocles. And so the pavilion was presenting these problems, and then it quoted uh, Buckminster Fuller, who said, the unfortunate thing is that spaceship Earth came without an operator's manual. We've got it. This is the operator's manual, the manufacturer's handbook. But he doesn't believe that. And in the center of the pavilion, put on by the United Nations now, they had a theater, and you went in, you watched a film, and the film was about worldwide cooperation, how we are going to solve our problems. And in the film, it said these words, why must there be good and bad, right and wrong, us and them? How do you like that? But human beings can't live by such standards. So when you exited the theater, there on the wall facing you, you, you immediately was an appeal for international cooperation, and it had this heading in large, bold print, for the common good. They just told us there was no good, but you can't live without it. But they have set themselves up as an elite who are going to tell the rest of us what is good, and we're going to have to live by their standards, I would a whole lot rather live by God's standards. Well, it all began in the Garden of Eden because you go to chapter 2 and the Lord took man, verse 15, put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it, to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. What would be wrong with knowing good and evil? Well, the whole thing about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil it was man's declaration of independence from God. If man disobeyed God, what he was grasping after was the ability to decide from within himself what was good and what was evil. He wouldn't have to follow God's standards anymore. Now, Adam and Eve were created in a uh, in innocence, we call it. We don't know how else uh, to, to describe it. There wasn't much temptation there. Uh, Adam couldn't rape anyone because the only woman there was his wife. Uh, you couldn't steal from anybody because you had everything there was. You couldn't get jealous of someone. Uh, it was as innocent uh, an environment as free of sin and temptation as you could possibly ask for. But God gently 
notice how gently he begins to put to set some limits and to say to Adam and Eve, now there are conditions. I'm your creator. You don't even know why you've been created. There would be no purpose or meaning to this entire universe unless it has a manufacturer who has a goal in mind, who brought it into existence for a purpose. And God tried to, as gently as he could, begin to impose this upon Adam and Eve. What did they have the most of? Trees, thousands and thousands of acres. We don't know how many thousands of acres. I don't think there was anything special about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I think it probably had the same kind of fruit as any other tree. But they were not to eat of this one. Don't touch that one. Don't touch this one particular tree. You couldn't give them anything easier, could you? You've got thousands of trees. Just don't touch this one. Just don't eat of this tree. Now, that's all I'm asking, Adam and Eve. Just don't eat of this tree. And Eve did it. And we'll get more into that later. But we want to just lay a foundation here. She was deceived. She was seduced by the enemy of God and man, the serpent, that old serpent, the devil. Uh, Revelation chapter 12 calls him who deceives the whole world. He began with her, and he now is deceiving the entire world. And how did he begin? You'll read of it in Isaiah 14, his fall. He said, I will be like the Most High. I will be like the Most High. And I can tell you it was not a bad self-image that caused his temptation. It was, he was lifted up with pride because of his brightness, because of his beauty, he was corrupted because of his beauty, and he wanted to be like God. He didn't... He, don't accuse Satan of being an atheist. Atheism is not the worst problem for the church. Atheists are not the greatest enemies of the church. It's those who have a false religion who are the greatest enemies of the church. You recognize an atheist, but someone who uses the same language and who talks about the same things that you do, but who has different meanings and insidiously seduces. That's the problem, and if they are within the church of Jesus Christ, it's even worse. Satan didn't deny the existence of God, he just denied the uniqueness of God, and he was going to be a God like God in God's class. I will be like the Most High. And apparently many angels followed him, and then he seduced Eve to become a God also, and she didn't know that this elite club of gods that she was joining were in fact demons who had rebelled against God. And there is a demon inside of every human being. Maybe that sounds too strong. Samuel Rutherford, uh, a Scottish preacher in the 17th century, known for his spiritual letters that inspired many hymns, said, every man has a house devil. Self is the house devil of every human being. And we worship at this altar. And there is a cosmic battle that sweeps across the galaxies into the very throne room of God. And you can read it in Job, how Satan himself appeared there and still appears there and will not be cast out until Revelation chapter 12. And we will overcome him by the blood of the Lamb, the word of our testimony, if we love not our lives unto death. And Eve believed. And Adam was not deceived, but he didn't want to lose his wife, and so he followed her. Now, you can imagine that this enemy who came into the garden to destroy that beautiful paradise and who seduced Eve has not stopped his seduction. And the Word of God tells us, turn over to well, first of all, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, that the last days will be characterized by an explosion of satanic activity and by an explosion of the seduction that began in the Garden of Eden. And notice what Paul writes to the Corinthians. 
He says, verse 3, 2 Corinthians 11, 3, I fear, lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. We want to talk a bit about the corruption, about the seduction, about the deception that is in the world today to arm ourselves and so that we can rescue others. If you turn back to Matthew 24, Jesus is one was shown the temple by his disciples as though, I guess, thinking he would be very impressed. He had created the universe. And he shocked them in verse 2 by saying the time was coming when this would be destroyed. There wouldn't be a stone left standing. And in verse 3, in the Mount of Olives, they privately say to him, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus begins to tell them some of the signs of the end. And books have been written and sermons have been preached about wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, pestilence, famine, and so forth, and you're familiar with these things. And some of the skeptics, for example, say, well, don't talk about the last days. I mean, it's been happening down through history in cycles. Uh, you want to talk about uh, wars? What about the Hundred Year War? You want to talk about uh, famines? I mean, they've had famines and Pestilence? What about the bubonic plague, the Black Death that swept Europe, leaving millions dead in its wake? I mean, it's happened in cycles, so don't get excited about it. Uh, of course, there are earthquakes because the Earth's crust is cooling and cracking, and it can all be explained scientifically. But I don't want to, we don't have time to go into the details, but I can tell you there are many things, signs of the last days that cannot be explained in that manner. For example, Israel is in their land first time in 2,500 years uh, since the Babylonian captivity that they have had their own sovereignty in their own land. And it had to be so because the prophets talked about the uh, last day's events all centering in Israel. Imagine that. That little tiny bit of sand over there has the focus of the attention of the whole world. And we won't take time to turn to it, but you can go back and read it for yourself in Zechariah chapter 12. It says, I'm going to make Jerusalem a cup of tre trembling and a burdensome stone for all nations. Can you imagine that? And it has come true in our day. There's the great power of the north that, that has risen, the Soviet Union. But there are other things. Jesus, notice in verse 22 in chapter 24, he says, except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. How about that? Some people will try to tell you that everything that Matthew 24 talks about was fulfilled in 70 A.D. when the armies of Titus destroyed Jerusalem. That's not true. They were not uh, in danger of wiping out all flesh upon planet Earth. You don't do that with swords and spears and, and crossbows. You don't even do that with uh, conventional bombs. But our generation, for the first time, we are the first generation living on the face of this earth to whom that prophecy makes sense because we have the weapons to destroy all life on planet Earth several times over. You can't explain that in cycles. Something unique is happening in our generation, in our day. Again, we don't take time to turn to it, but Revelation 13, and you know the verses there, talks about that mark on the hand and on the forehead. It talks about someone who will control all banking and commerce on the face of this earth. You can't buy or sell. That was ridiculous until electronic data processing came along and satellite uh, communication satellites and instantaneous communication and instantaneous banking uh, networks around the world. Our generation, again, is the first generation for whom that prophecy begins to make some sense. We are living in very interesting days, to put it mildly. I think we're living in the last days. But there's a greater sign that Jesus gave. It's the sign that he mentioned, first of all. It was the sign that he emphasized over and over. It's the one that I believe is the most important, and it's the one we want to deal with this evening. Verse 4, 
Jesus answered and said, notice it's not until you get down in uh, verse 6 and on that he talks about wars, rumors of wars, and so forth. But notice what he says first. Jesus said unto them, Take heed or beware that no man deceive you. Jesus says there is a day of deception coming. It's religious deception, amazingly. Many people were not aware that the Satan movement was much larger than the Jesus movement. Where I come from in Southern California, we have one church. I happen to have a, an in-house confidential memorandum from this church of Wicca, a satanic church, and they boast over 8,000 members. They talk about their summer vacation camps where they convert young people. They talk about their weekly release time classes where, uh, in California at least, uh, children in public school are allowed out for an hour a week to get religious instruction. And they're giving religious instruction. They talk about how to infiltrate mainline fundamentalist churches, wear a cross and have a big smile and say praise the Lord frequently. They talk about their unlimited funds from international bankers, and on and on it goes. A time of religious revival, but a time of great deception. And Jesus warned about it. And he specifies three th elements that would be involved in this deception. And you'll find that in verses 5, 11, and 24. Many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. They don't come in the name of Charlemagne. They don't pretend to be Napoleon. They don't pretend to be Genghis Khan. But they pretend to be Christ. How about that? He predicted it. It's happening in our day. And then verse 11, many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. Verse 24, there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have warned you beforehand. Signs and wonders. There are some people who feel that what we need is signs and wonders. That the great need in the last days is for signs and wonders. My Bible says the great need in the last days is to be able to distinguish between false signs and wonders and what is really from God. There are great miracle workers who will oppose the truth. Jesus himself prophesied. You could read it in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8 where Paul writes and he says, Now as Jannes and Jambres, who were they? The magicians in Pharaoh's court who were able up to a point apparently to duplicate or at least to counterfeit the miracles that God did through Moses and Aaron. As Jannes and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also. These miracle workers resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. And that verse, that chapter begins in the last days. Dangerous times will come. He talks about miracle workers who will be deceivers and who will deceive many. And if you want to know the depth of the deception, Matthew 7, verses 22 and 23, Jesus said, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? In your name we cast out devils. In your name we did miracles. And Jesus says, I will say to you, I never knew you, never knew you. Solemn words from the lips of the one who said, I know my sheep and am known of mine, and he never knew them. They were never his sheep, but they posed as Christian leaders who were highly acclaimed and who seemed to be miracle workers, and they were seducers of the flock. Now, I think that if Jesus goes to this much trouble, and, and we're only touching on a few verses, and Paul and the, and the apostles write about this, then I think we ought to give it our attention. I can confess to you, I never used to pay much attention to prophecy because it seemed so difficult, so nebulous. There were so many beasts, you know, in Daniel or Revelation and so many different theories, but I became convicted by the Lord that the Bible talks about the last days and gives us signs of the last days as though God expects that there would be a generation living on this earth at some time in history who, based upon what the Bible has told them and has warned them about and the signs that the Word of God has given, would recognize the day in which they lived and would do something about it. I think that the evidence is overwhelming that we are in that day, and I want to give you some of that evidence this evening. 
In the Garden of Eden, the serpent presented four basic lies, and we will come back to these again and again, but I want to give them to you right up at the beginning so you can see how they are woven through the entire fabric of cultism and old cultism. Four basic lies. The first one is not stated explicitly, but it is the necessary. It's implied in the others. And those four lies very quickly are, number one, God is not personal but a force. Now you know how popular that idea has become. When you walked out of that first Star Wars film series, you walked out in the street, there was one thought that remained with you, may the force be with you. And you saw it on bumper stickers and t-shirts. And a new concept of God had come into our society and was gaining acceptability. That God is not personal but a force. And it's very appealing to human beings because a force, being impersonal, won't hassle you with morals. And then the second line was there's no death. You don't die, you just get recycled. Because this force is in everything, reincarnation. You keep coming back and back and we're evolving higher and higher. And the third lie was you can be like God. Cosmic evolution. Evolution is not a scientific theory. It's been at the heart of occultism for thousands of years. Evolution is the vehicle whereby karma and reincarnation work. What's the point of being reincarnated if you're not evolving higher? And that's the whole teaching of Eastern mysticism. The goal of yoga, for example, is self-realization, to realize that you are God. It comes out of the Garden of Eden, out of the mouth of the serpent. And then the fourth lie, of course, was that it's in the tree of knowledge. There's nothing wrong with you. It's just the way you think. You have to change your perception. You misperceive reality and you impose upon it your own limitations. But if you only realize that you have an infinite potential within, then you can realize who you really are. You are God. You are it. You have everything. This, these ideas have been exploding in our day. I've interviewed young people around the world who on a drug trip met spirit beings who told them exactly the same lies that the serpent told Eve in the Garden of Eden. They come out of seances. They come out of Ouija boards. They come out of yogic trances. But it began with the drug movement. And I want to take a moment to explain the relevance of that. The explosion began in the 50s and the 60s. In the New Testament, God comes down very hard on something that he calls sorcery. And there are two Greek words that are used that are translated sorcery in the King James Bible. One is magia, Simon the magician in the book of Acts. He had magic powers. They're looking for magic powers, godlike powers. And the other word is pharmakia, or pharmacus, from which we get the word drugs. A sorcerer is a person who takes consciousness-altering drugs in order to contact spirit beings for gaining supernatural power. My alma mater, UCLA, gave Carlos Castaneda his PhD in anthropology for the manuscript of his book, Journey to Ixlan which was the story of how Don Juan, a Yaqui Indian sorcerer, initiated him into the sorcerer's world through mescaline. He met the god Mescalito. He developed cosmic powers. And some of you sitting here today, if you've been on drugs, you know what I'm talking about. There is an experience that you gain. There are young people who dropped out to tune in and turn on, following people like Timothy Leary, experienced a spiritual dimension that they had not known existed before. And it transformed their lives, it changed their worldview, and we have initiated an entire generation into sorcery. And all of the talk about uh, the damage uh, that some of these drugs do to the genes, to the sex organs, and, and to the brain cells and so forth is secondary compared with what it does spiritually. It puts you in touch with demonic entities and it is part of a great deception that began in the Garden of Eden. Now, that opened the door. It opened our young people's minds to the cosmic gospel of the gurus from the East who flooded our shores. Every guru, and listen carefully to what I'm saying, 
Every guru was sent by his guru for the specific purpose of converting the world to Hinduism. In 1979, in Allahabad, for example, in a large World Congress on Hinduism, presided over, by the way, by the Dalai Lama of Tibetan Buddhism. So you see the connection. One of the speakers said the day is drawing near when our goal will have been accomplished with the destruction of Christianity and the establishment of Hinduism as the new world religion. Now, let me back up a little bit and explain what happens here. Sir John Eccles, Nobel Prize winner for his research on the brain, describes the brain as, quote, a machine that a ghost can operate, unquote. Shall I say that again? Your brain is a machine that a ghost can operate. You are the ghost that operates it. Your spirit beings, a soul and spirit living inside of a physical body, telekinesis is going on right now. Somehow a fantastic connection that God has made between my spirit and my brain, and I'm operating this body and you are doing the same. That's in a normal state of consciousness, but in an altered state of consciousness. That normal connection between you and your brain is loosened and that allows another spirit to interpose itself, begin to tick off the neurons in your brain and create an entire universe of illusion. That's where the out-of-body experiences come from. That's where the psychedelic uh, colors and experiences, the psychic powers, etc., come from. You're not really out of your body. A demon is playing a videotape in your brain. You're being deceived. It's the doorway to sorcery. It's the doorway to seduction. And we have initiated an entire generation into sorcery. And the dropouts, the hippies, the, the sandal-footed, long, uh, long-haired, bearded hippies of the 50s and 60s, you know who they are today? They're your leading psychiatrists and psychologists, university professors, leading politicians, medical doctors, and so forth. We are being fed from the top down what they first learn in a drug trip and then in yoga. And parents often talk to me and say, well, my son and my daughter was involved in drugs, and it was a horrendous experience, but they're into yoga now, and I don't understand this yoga thing, but thank God at least they're not on drugs anymore. Well, I have to say I'm sorry to inform you, drugs was the kindergarten, yoga is the graduate school. They've moved into the hard stuff now. You can get a whole lot higher on yoga than you ever did on drugs. It wasn't true 20 years ago, but today you would be hard-pressed to find one YMCA or YWCA across America that does not teach yoga. And as I already said, the goal is to realize the serpent's lie that you are God. Now, this spawned <clears throat> a movement that you've been hearing a bit about lately. My, the first book that I wrote about it was called Peace, Prosperity, and the Coming Holocaust. The subtitle of that book was The New Age Movement in Prophecy. The New Age Movement. When we first began talking about this, some of us in writing about it, many of the critics said, you're exaggerating, it's a passing fad, it's going to go away, don't get people excited. I want to document a little bit about this movement tonight. Edgar Mitchell, for example, he has a Doctor of Science degree, six man to walk the face of the moon, commander of Apollo 14, and on Apollo 14 he was doing uh, telepathy experiments back to planet Earth. Edgar Mitchell on Apollo 14 had a mystical experience of unity consciousness, and it so transformed his life that when he came back to planet Earth, he abandoned the outer space program to join the inner space program, which is literally the new frontier of modern science. They have a magazine, for example, and I happen to have an advertisement, and as I read some of it, you, I think you will begin to put some of the pieces together now from what we've talked about. Inner space. Deep within you is the potential, is the first line. The human potential movement is another word for the New Age movement. These are sincere people who believe that the answer lies not with God, but with ourselves. Not through inviting Jesus Christ to come in as our Savior and Lord, but through tapping in, <clears throat> pardon me, through tapping in, to this infinite potential that we have within. Well, if you have an infinite potential, then you're God. Deep within you is the potential. Inner space. Now there's a magazine to help you find it. 
Inner Space is the most comprehensive and contemporary magazine about mind and spirit. I want you to notice some words. Spirit. What do they mean by spirit? You've heard of holistic medicine. I'm sure everyone has. You'll see a triangle, mind, body, spirit. Three, three simple questions immediately. You know, if there's one goal that I have, I'm, I have a number of goals, but one of the major goals is to get people to think for themselves. I think that some pastors don't want their people to think. They want to be able to tell you what to do. That's one of the problems. There's a form of guruism in the Church of Jesus Christ today. And to follow a guru, you check your mind at the door, and they literally do your thinking for you. Sun Myung Moon says, I am their mind. And you've got to learn to think for yourself because you have individual moral accountability. Well, what should you ask? Mind, body, spirit, holistic medicine. What kind of medicine do you give to spirits? Doctor, did you study spirit in medical school? Well, now, doctor, uh, spirit, isn't that really a religious term? Would you please tell me, doctor, what religion is this that you're passing off on your patients in the name of the latest medical science? I can tell you what it is. It's witchcraft. It's called shamanism, another word you're going to hear increasingly about. Shamanism. Michael Harner with the Academy of Science of the State of New York, one of the leading anthropologists in the world. He's not a critic like me. He believes in this. In his book, The Way of the Shaman, tells you, first of all, shamanism is a word that comes from the Tungus tribe in Siberia. It's what they call their witch doctor, their medicine man. And anthropologists have adopted it universally for what we used to call medicine men, witches, sorcerers, wizards, voodoo, and so forth, because it's it doesn't have the connotations of evil. It's not going to freak you out. It sounds quite nice. Shaman rolls off the tongue very nicely. But there's another reason why they've done this, because he says you can travel around this world and you can visit cultures that have been isolated for thousands of years by thousands of miles of ocean. Culturally, they're as different as night and day, and when you investigate their shamanism, their witchcraft, it is identical everywhere on the face of this earth. Oh, they have a few different fetishes and a few different rituals, but at the roots, it is identical, obviously a common source of inspiration. And you can trace it right back to the serpent in the Garden of Eden. Now, here's a man who believes in this, and listen to what he says on page 136 of that book. He says, the burgeoning field of holistic medicine shows a remarkable amount of re-experimentation with the basic methods long practiced in shamanism. He says, you want to know what holistic medicine is? It's a revival of witchcraft in the Western world under new terms, that's all. Don't quarrel with me for saying that. Here's a man who believes in it, a leading anthropologist. That's exactly what it is. You notice the word spirit? Ask yourself, what are atheists, what are humanists uh, talking about spirit? What do they mean when they talk about spirit? They don't mean the Holy Spirit, and they don't mean even the biblical view of soul and spirit. They have a mystical view. Another word for the New Age movement is the consciousness revolution that the answer is in higher states of consciousness, reached under drugs or in yoga or hypnosis and so forth. Recent breakthroughs in advanced physics that point to an underlying unity of all matter and suggest the existence of a universal soul. How about that? This is religion. It's not Christianity. It is the enemy of Christianity. It is something that challenges Christianity. But unfortunately, there are many Christians who, when they hear someone talk about soul or spirit, they think they're on our side. In fact, they are seducing. The force is not a, a synonym for God. It is a substitute for the true God. You understand what I'm trying to say? We have to awaken to what's going on out there and things that your young people are being seduced with a unity to all things, holistic. What do, what, what do we mean by that? Brian Josephson, for example, Nobel Prize winner for his research on the brain, describes the brain, I'm sorry, Nobel Prize winner in physics in 1973, Brian Josephson. And Dr. Josephson is risking his international reputation on his belief that he's going to explore the entire universe from the farthest reaches of the cosmos to the innermost depths of the atom by looking within himself. 
You get that? Here's a Nobel Prize winner in physics who's going to explore the farthest reaches of the cosmos and down into the innermost depths of the atom by looking within himself. You say the man has slipped. No, he hasn't. He's got good scientific reasons for which you do not have an apologetic. Go into your Christian bookstores and you won't find an apologetic for what I'm talking about. Things that are coming down so fast that you're going to lose a whole generation of young people. Well, what is the rationale? Well, they tell us that very soon, in major theaters, the action will no longer be confined to the big screen, but you're going to have images running up and down the aisles and all through the audience that you can look at from 360 degrees. You saw primitive forms in Star Wars. They're called holograms. Why are they called holograms? Because you can cut them into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces. No matter how small a piece you come up with, it's still every small piece still has the whole picture. It's very much like a single cell in the human body, which is why, theoretically, we can clone an entire human being from any cell in the body because any cell has the entire DNA formula for replicating the whole person. Well, then what could be more logical than for these scientists to say, the structure of this entire universe is holographic? Well, you know what that means. That means that you and I, each of us, is a tiny holographic image of the whole. That means we've got everything inside of us. All wisdom, all power, all knowledge, everything that ever was or ever will be, you're it, I'm it. And the experience you had on drugs of unity consciousness or through yoga looking within and realizing you're God, that's the truth. And science supports it. And it's the lie out of the serpent's mouth. And it's moving rapidly and unfortunately even coming into the church of Jesus Christ. Just very quickly, let me give you a few examples. Discover the New Age. I've been accused of making up the whole idea of the New Age movement in order to sell books. I didn't make this poster up, I, I guarantee you. But to show you how new this is, New Age Journal, you can pick this up in your grocery store uh, on the stands there. Around the globe, not just in urban areas or rural retreats, but everywhere, a growing number of people are choosing positive alternatives in lifestyle attitude. A positive alternative, that's another word for sin. There are no morals. There's no good or evil. It's just an alternative. And, of course, it's positive. Positive meaning it's what I would like. In 1973, the New Age Journal was launched because there was no publication that looked at this outpouring of consciousness as one trend. Are you listening to what they're saying? An awakening of all peoples on earth. I couldn't have said it better if I had written it for them to analyze what's happening. People are awakening to something. There's something happening on this globe. In The Aquarian Conspiracy, Marilyn Ferguson wrote the New Age Bible. She says, a leaderless but powerful network is working to bring about radical change in the United States. Its members have broken with key elements of Western thought, a great, shuddering, irrevocable shift is overtaking us. It is a new mind, a turnabout in consciousness, in critical numbers of individuals, a network powerful enough to bring about radical change in our culture. This network, the Aquarian Conspiracy, that's another word for the New Age movement, the Age of Aquarius. You want to have a good biblical support for this from these people? Why, they're not against the Bible. You know why the early Christians used the sign of the fish? Because they lived in the Piscean Age. And look on the Zodiac. Of course, everybody's into astrology. Look on the Zodiac, and the sign of the Pisces Age is a fish. And don't you know that Jesus himself foretold the coming of a new age and a new age Messiah, and that he was bowing out to make way for a, a, a new Messiah? When he said to his disciples, go into this village and you will find a man there bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him to an upper room, furnished, and that's where we'll have the Last Supper. And that's where Jesus bowed out. And don't you know what the sign of the age of Aquarius is? The Aquarian sign on the zodiac is a man bearing a pitcher of water. So you see, Jesus foretold the coming of the age of Aquarius and the new Messiah, which these people are talking about today. You better be prepared to deal with some of these ideas. This network, the Aquarian Conspiracy, has already enlisted the minds, hearts, and resources of some of our most advanced thinkers, including Nobel laureate scientists, philosophers, statesmen, celebrities, who are working to create a different kind of society. Well, 
at the root of it are the lies. Self-discovery, a very popular magazine in Hollywood. This was picked up in the executive offices of Warner Brothers. This is a mandala for flipping you into an altered state of consciousness. And self-discovery, you notice, find out who you are. You have the answer within you. And down here at the bottom, it says, whenever you make a mistake, remember, you are God. God doesn't make mistakes. He just has experiences. An article in the Los Angeles Times, Goddesses of Coming New Age, probe the meaning of it all. And the reporter was reporting, these were leaders in the women's movement. She says the women are encouraged to express their new spirituality. It's a spiritual movement. She puts quotes around new and a dash, which is the oldest on earth. What is the oldest spiritual movement on earth? Wicca, witchcraft. This is a brochure from a very large women's conference in Southern California. Page after page of the workshops you ladies could have taken. Let me just read a couple of them for you. Pathways to your inner light. These are taught by PhDs, RNs, and so forth. Introduction to goddess consciousness and the craft. And you would have to be very naive to think they mean handcraft. This is an ad for, or an article from the business page of the Los Angeles Times. Here's an attractive woman floating on a heavy Epsom salt solution in a, an isolation tank. Some of you saw the film, Altered States, exactly the same thing. This is the latest uh, uh, method for tired businessmen to relax and renew themselves. Um, you're floating on a heavy Epsom salt solution. You're totally isolated from sight or sound. And your body, just the pulse beat, the beating of your heart, your breathing causes erratic motions that put you into an altered state. And you develop out-of-body experiences and so forth. And you say, well, they don't know what they're doing. Indeed, they do know what they're doing. They call it the samadhi tank. Samadhi is what the Buddhists call satori, God consciousness. Here's another attractive woman in a yoga position, Self-Discovery Magazine again, and the caption here says, Samadhi is loose in America. Indeed it is. And people don't know what they're getting into. Here's another ad, a Sony ad, a woman in a space suit in a modified yoga position levitating, and she's listening to something through these earphones. What could it be? Here's an advertisement for a cassette developed by a computer. It's They've got new age music out there, in case you're not aware of that. And here are the testimonies of the people telling how listening to this cassette put them out of their body. They had psychic experiences, developed psychic powers. Here's Valley of the Sun self-help tapes, a self-hypnosis, self-improvement tapes. And on the front of the catalog, it says, your conscious mind here is beautiful. Uh, relaxing music while your subconscious mind hears and acts on the suggestions behind the music. What suggestions? By whom? For what purpose? You better ask yourself. This was picked off of the bulletin board of Rockwell International in Southern California. New Age thinking is here and producing results. This New Age course has been taken by fire departments, the Bell Telephone System, Xerox, IBM, across America. In fact, it is recommended by the chief chaplain of the armed forces of the United States of America. You'll find it everywhere. New Age Chicago, I picked up in Chicago. New World, I picked up in a small town uh, in, in uh, Southern California. New Texas, the same thing. New Age Source, in another place. The Three Rivers Network, because they're involved in networking working with one another to promote these ideas. This, of course, is from Pittsburgh. Politics in the New Age. They have their politicians, and they're working very hard to, to take over the world, literally, with their ideas. And unfortunately, as we will document in subsequent sessions, these very ideas have come into the Church of Jesus Christ. And as I often say, if a witch doctor came dancing down the aisles in our churches in his paint and feathers and fetishes and rattles, We'd throw him out, or we would at least try to convert him. But when he walks in in a business suit or a clerical collar, and he tells us that what he's offering is simply the latest innovations in self-improvement methodologies that have 
proven so beneficial for leading businessmen out there. He is not recognized for the witch doctor that he is. And when he clothes his, uh, his witchcraft, his shamanism, in biblical language, then the church is seduced. And I have a very great concern for that today. Jesus warned about seduction. Paul said, I'm concerned lest the serpent who beguiled Eve should seduce you. He was talking to Christians. We need to know for ourselves. We need to know for our families. We need to awaken. We need to contend earnestly for the faith. We need to get back to this book, the Bible, the manufacturer's handbook. We need to know what we believe and why we believe it on the basis of this book. I don't want to be your guru. I don't want you to follow me. I want you to think for yourself and follow the Lord and follow his word. But we've got to begin to take it seriously because the Bible warned of seduction. We're living in the last days, a time of great deception and seduction. We're warned about this. Then let's wake up and let's try to rescue as many as we possibly can. It's not only for your benefit, but it's for the benefit of those around you. And many of us, I fear, have lost communication with the world in which we live. Christians tend to be very isolated. And some of you are out there witnessing and you're talking about God and you think you're communicating and the person you're talking to is thinking Star Wars Force. Or, or you're talking about Christ and they're thinking Christ consciousness. You know, the only thing that separated Jesus from the rest of us was he had attained to a higher state of consciousness than the rest of us, Christ consciousness. And the whole goal is for us all to attain to this and become the Christ. Not far from where I live is a New Age synagogue. I don't call it that. They call it that. Mahomor Shalom and Ted Falcon, the rabbi at this New Age synagogue, says, the day is coming when the cry will go out, will the real Messiah please stand? And when the time has come, we will all arise and the world will be transformed because we're all the Christ. And we will have realized finally who we are and this tremendous potential that we have within us. And those ideas, again, are coming into the church of Jesus Christ as well. It's staggering what is happening today. And I have a concern to warn people to get us back to God's word and to realize we are in a cosmic battle, a battle for souls. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. And let's not just be pew sitters. Let's not just uh, be sitting around at home, but as Christians realizing time is short. You know, one of the things that C.S. Lewis said that impressed me a great deal, and I don't agree with everything that C.S. Lewis said, but God gave him some tremendous insights. And he said, every person that you see on the job, at school, in your neighborhood, wherever, is an eternal being. And they will either shine as the stars in the presence of God in inexpressible joy forever and forever, or they will be creatures of inexpressible horror and torment separated from God forever and forever. If that doesn't move us to do something for our friends, our relatives, our neighbors, those about us, and to awaken to what's happening and to stand against it with the truth of God against the lie of the serpent. Is there anything that must happen before the rapture? If you watch Christian television, a lot of it, you'll be told that what we need to have is a worldwide revival. I hope and pray for revival. But the Bible seems to indicate, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, among other scriptures, that a great apostasy must come before the day of the Lord. And as I've been investigating the cult explosion, the New Age movement, the seduction of Christianity, the things that are happening in the world around me, I experience what I call the accident syndrome. If you've ever been in an accident, I've been in two of them myself, uh, at least I don't know about you, but the first thing that occurred to me was, it can't be happening, not to me, <laughs> it's impossible. But you find yourself in the middle of a wreckage and it has happened. And as I've seen events uh, reaching a I believe, heading towards a climax in the world around us, I say, Lord, it can't be happening. I don't believe it, and, and I don't want to. And you feel paranoid. You don't want to run around with a sign, the end is near, but I think the end is near. Uh, and, and I don't want to become paranoid, but it looks to me, I say, Lord, the things that I see in the world around seem to correlate exactly 
with the signs of the last days. It looks like we're moving into this great apostasy. Okay, let's turn together to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. <clears throat> Second Thessalonians chapter 2. And we'll read just quickly from verse 1. Now, we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. I would take that to be <clears throat> his coming and power and glory when he rescues Israel. And by our gathering together unto him, I would take that to be the rapture. And I believe those are two different events. That ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit, <clears throat> nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand, or has already come. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there comes a great signs and wonders miracle revival. Uh, it, well, I've got the wrong translation here. Let me go back over it again. You know, sometimes people ask, what is standing in the way of the Lord returning. Is there any event? Israel's back in her land. The great power of the north is ready to move in. I don't think anyone doubts that that's going to happen. But is there anything <clears throat> that must happen before Christ returns? And the Bible tells us one thing. He says it. Let's read it again. That day shall not come except there come a falling away, an apostasy first. Why must there be an apostasy? Why must there be a falling away? A logical question. I've given a lot of thought and a lot of prayer to it, and I don't claim to have necessarily the only answer, certainly not all of the answers. But I think one of the reasons, well, if you... Let's go down, and, and, and I think we'll understand a little better. Verse 9, it's talking about one, the Antichrist, <clears throat> whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. You wonder why it says all power. Satan has a lot of power, and you can read in the book of Job about some of the power that Satan has. He could stir up the Sabaeans and the Chaldeans and send in their armies and steal the flocks and kill the herdsmen of Job and always leave one survivor to tell Job. He could knock a house down where Job's children were parting and kill everybody except one person. He has tremendous power, tremendous control. He could put boils on Job. He could have taken Job's life, but God wouldn't allow him to do it. Remember, God said you can touch his possessions, you can't touch him. That didn't do it, so God says you can touch his body, but you can't take his life. Satan has tremendous power, but it is restrained by God at this point. Now, he can only do what you allow him to do also. If you are greedy, you want power, you want wealth, you want success, you want things for yourself, then you may get it and lose your soul because you can open the doors to Satan in your life. You can open the doors through occult involvement. But God is restraining him. But there, the day is coming when I believe the Bible says God isn't going to restrain him anymore. And some, all of the power of Satan will be loosed upon this earth. And notice what it says. <clears throat> He's coming with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness. He deceives the whole world, the Scripture says. Revelation chapter 12, that old serpent, the devil, who deceives the whole world with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they received not the love of the truth. Do you love the truth? You really want your husband to tell you the truth, wives? And husbands, you want your wives to tell you the truth? Children and parents? We tend not to tell people the truth. We tend to flatter them. We want to be positive, you know. Uh, that's part of the saying today. 
And if I'm a medical doctor and you come to me with a ruptured appendix and you need to be on the operating table within 30 minutes or you're dead, but I wouldn't want to upset you by telling you the truth. Might give you a bad self-image. You might get down on yourself. So I tell you that that 105 degree fever, that glow in your cheeks is the glow of health. And if you have a little problem, well, you might try an aspirin. That's not love. <clears throat> love speaks the truth. We speak in love, but we must speak the truth in love. And we must be lovers of the truth. And if you don't love the truth, if you want to cover things up in your life and you don't want your life to be totally open before God and before others, and you want to walk in darkness and not in the light, then you are putting yourself in the hands of Satan and you are setting yourselves up for delusion. And that's what this talks about. They will receive... <clears throat> It says, because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved, for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. I wouldn't dare to write something like that. That's horrible. That's frightening. But this is the word of God. You say, that's not fair that God would send a strong delusion upon people and then judge them for it, and they're damned, and there's no hope for them anymore. How could God do that? That's not fair. God is saying here, the day is coming when he's going to help people believe what they want to believe. And if you didn't really want to believe the truth, if you really hoped that there was something else that was the truth, that would allow you to have your way, that would allow you to believe what you wanted to believe, if you could just find a verse somewhere in the Bible that would back up what you really wanted to believe. You didn't want to read the Bible as a book that would correct you, but you wanted to read, go to the Bible as a book where you could find some proof text that would back up what you wanted to believe. Then God says, he's going to help you to believe the lie that you want to believe. It's your fault. It's not God's fault. And you know he's going to demonstrate something. He's going to demonstrate that what you believe is important. Not because you can make it happen by believing it, but because you will either believe the truth of God or you will believe the lie of Satan. And your eternal destiny will depend upon what you believe. And he's going to demonstrate to the, to the entire universe that positive thinking doesn't work, that mind power doesn't work, that saying it is so doesn't make it so, that believing it is so, the whole world is going to believe a lie and it won't make it so. You don't get your prayers answered by believing that what you're praying for will happen. You ha faith is in God. And if faith is in God, you're going to believe that God will do it. Well, then he's not going to do it unless it's his will. And you can't believe that it will happen unless you know that it's God's will and you know that you are in a right relationship with him for him to do it through you and that you are his chosen instrument to do it. But a lot of Christians think that if I can only believe that what I'm praying for will happen, that will make it happen. That's mind power. You don't need God. You don't need the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. And he's going to send a strong delusion. Now, this strong delusion doesn't happen just like that. The Antichrist is going to rise. He's going to be worshipped as God. Notice verse 4. A man will arise who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. I think most Bible scholars would agree that this verse is talking about a particular man, the Antichrist, and a particular temple that will yet be rebuilt in Jerusalem where he will sit and declare himself to be God, and the world's going to believe it. But you can also see the religion of the Antichrist. Our bodies are supposed to be the temple of God. What know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which you have of God? Paul writes to believers at Corinth, and you are not your own, you are bought with a price. And for the first time in the history of the world, millions of people in the Western world, and it's becoming even more popular in the East than it has been, 
through yoga, through transcendental meditation, through various forms of mind control and mind power, through belief in the human potential movement, that you have an infinite potential, they are looking within to discover what's called the higher self or the true self, and having discovered the true self to discover that they are God. And this is what the apostasy is about. And we talked last night about the New Age movement and some of these, the four basic lies that Satan presented to Eve in the Garden of Eden, that God is not personal but a force, that you don't die, you get recycled, reincarnation, that we're evolving upward to Godhood, and that the answer is in knowledge. You need to adjust your thinking and realize this infinite potential you have. And all of these ideas are in the church, and the apostasy is related to the church. That's how I became concerned about it. I was investigating what was happening out in the world, in the world of the cults and the occult, and I saw that the same things were being taught in Christian books and in Christian films and in Christian magazines and on Christian television and radio because these same ideas have permeated the church. Let me just quickly give you some examples. This happens to be uh, sort of the bulletin from St. James 197 Piccadilly, London, a historic church. And let me read you just from their events. Thursday night they have a monthly group for meditation and healing. Saturday the Sufi healing order meets. On Tuesdays they have a yoga meditation class. Some of the special meetings that were coming up on April the 18th in this particular year, I think this was a year ago or two, I can't remember when I picked it up over there in London. The talk was titled, Personal Religion Beyond Dogma. In other words, let's not be dogmatic about this. Don't ask a God to bear your cross, but find your God within. April 25th, a week later, Health for the New Age. And that talk included meditation, visualization, and so forth. Another talk a little later on was on lifetime astrology. Another one was about the philosophy for the new age. Another one, psychic phenomena. Another one, the center within. Another one, new age groups, the collective unconscious, and networks. This is an Anglican church right down in the center of London, okay? Into the new age as deeply as you can possibly get. This happens to be the 1985 program for the National Catholic Education Association. I'm not going to go into the details of it. The keynote speaker was Robert Mueller, Assistant Secretary General at that time of the United Nations, one of the leading New Agers in the world. He gave the keynote address, Gateway to Global Understanding, How to Develop Citizenship of the World, a Planetary Thinking, Planetary Citizenship, a One World. We're going to unite in a One World Government and we're going to have a one world religion. Another one of the key addresses was guiding God's children toward world citizenship in a collaborative ministry for parents, teachers, and the parish community. This is the about 7,000 Catholic uh, teachers came from Catholic schools across the country. Carl Sagan gave one of the major addresses as well. Sagan the pagan. Why do I call him Sagan the pagan? Because he is a pagan, and he worships the cosmos. You'll read about him in Romans chapter 1. They worship the creation instead of the creator. And he talks about the cosmos, the name of his great series, the cosmos, and he gets very worshipful. Ah, <gasps> oh, in the presence of the cosmos. Because the cosmos has birthed us all. And we're all the children of the cosmos. And we've been brought forth by this great cosmic force that we've evolved to this place and so forth. He worships... The cosmos, he's a pagan. He gave one of the keynote addresses. One of the major addresses, a working model of new age learning. I don't want to go on into more details, but let me read one other one. Seminary department, major session, world mission, biblical foundations. How can we educate seminarians to be effective ministers to an emerging world church? Yes, there is an emerging world church, the church of the Antichrist. It's going to be full the day after the rapture. This happens to be just a newspaper article in the Catholic accent 
Thursday, August 1st, 1985, you've got some of the sisters, the nuns, uh, going through yoga uh, positions, uh, chanting and meditating in Zen. Uh, here's a priest in a, in a Buddhist robe and so forth. This is the sort of thing that's happening. Well, you say, that's Catholics and that's Anglicans. Well, let's go to the Presbyterians. Um, I don't know how many of you have seen this. New Age Dawning. The five-year plan for evangelism in the Presbyterian Church USA. On every page, dawning of a new age. New Age Dawning, the needs of a new age. Evangelism principles for the new age and so forth. And you say, well, don't fault these good people. Uh, just because they pick up a, a clever uh, term like New Age, they didn't really know what it meant. And this is an article in Monday morning, July 1985. Robert Manili is the author. New Age Dawning, choosing the title, is the, is the title of the article. He was the chairman of the committee that chose this title. And he tells you how they took a couple of years to very carefully choose the title. And many people came to them and said, don't use this title, it's confusing at the very least. It would identify us with the New Age movement and that's very bad. And he gives you six reasons why they still chose the title. I want to read just reason number five. He said, the reality is that those who oppose the New Age movement would likely oppose much of what the Presbyterian Church USA already is doing and saying in many social and justice issues namely peacemaking, hunger, disarmament, holistic views of life and housing. He says, we're doing in those areas what the New Agers believe in. So don't fault us. We know what we're doing when we choose the title New Age Donning. This brochure, as far as I know, I think the first time it was given out was at the Presbyterian Renewal Congress that was held January 1985 in Dallas, Texas. The keynote speaker was a well-known evangelical leader author of 15 or 20 books, highly acclaimed, recommended by uh, leading Christians. His name is Bruce Larson, pastor of the um, University Presbyterian Church in Seattle, Washington. He had already gone on record what he believes about the New Age movement. And let me read it. I had and have now a growing belief that we're in the beginning of an exciting new age, a new age which I believe is already imminent and will change life for all people upon this globe. And then he says, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. Pierre Teilhard de Chardin was a Catholic monk whose teachings were so heretical the Catholic Church forbade him to publish them. He is called the father of the new age movement. When Marilyn Ferguson wrote The Aquarian Conspiracy and she polled 185 New Age leaders from around the country. Most of them said that they had been led into the New Age, into New Age beliefs through the teachings of Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. He talked about evolving through the noosphere, the theosphere, and merging into Godhood at the Omega point. Last night we mentioned Planetary Initiative for the World We Choose, which is one of the largest New Age networking organizations that comes out of the United Nations involved with the Association for Humanistic Psychology, the Club of Rome, and so forth. Their logo is the Earth with the Omega around it of Pierre Teilhard de Chardin because that's where we merge into Godhood. And so Bruce Larson says, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin talks about his dreams for the evolution of a new being and a new society. My dream is that we're on the verge of such a discovery. Either he doesn't know what Pierre Teilhard de Chardin is talking about or we're in very bad trouble. Either way, I think we're in very bad trouble. Well, let's get a little closer home. How about the Southern Baptist Church? Here is a news release. News release from Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary. That's a mainstream Southern Baptist seminary in Mill Valley, California. February 13, 1986. Dr. Doran C. McCarty, professor of ministry at Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary, proposed a new shaman in his faculty inaugural address during the seminary's academic convocation. We talked about shamanism last night. A shaman is a witch doctor. Entitled The Making of the New Shaman, McCarty's address was presented as part of the first chapel service of the spring semester. The New Testament picture of Jesus was that of a shaman says McCarty. 
Can you imagine a characterization of Jesus by a professor in a Southern Baptist seminary as a shaman, a witch doctor? But that's also taught by Morton T. Kelsey, who, by the way, was the pastor of Agnes Sanford, and we talk about Agnes Sanford uh, in The Seduction of Christianity, who brought inner healing and visualization into the Church of Jesus Christ, and Morton Kelsey, and Agnes' son, Jack, You'll find his books, John Sanford, without the D. They went to the C.G. Jung Institute near Zurich, Switzerland, to study, and they became thoroughgoing Jungian psychologists. And we, again, will discuss what that means later. And she picked up these ideas from him. Carl Jung said you can communicate with the dead, and Morton Kelsey said he communicated with the spirit of his dead mother, who had died to redeem him much as Jesus had. He advocates communicating with God through Ouija boards and so forth. He calls Jesus a shaman, a witch doctor, and says that he was in the great shamanic tradition and that uh, Christian churches ought to develop ESP, these psychic powers, these shamanic powers. Now, you can go to some of the best seminaries, evangelical seminaries in the United States, and you will find the writings, the books of Morton T. Kelsey. And they're studied in the graduate psychology department. I have a letter from a young man at one of these seminaries. He's, he's writing to the publisher. He says, this is to thank you for your courage in publishing books such as Dave Hunt's The Seduction of Christianity. I'm finishing an MA in theology here, at, and he names a seminary, which I will leave out for the moment, and we'll begin doctoral studies next September. I could recount many instances from my personal experience at this seminary that would corroborate the relevance and truth of what Hunt writes about. We began the seduction of Christianity with a gentleman in the first chapter named Napoleon Hill. Napoleon Hill, among his many books, his most famous was called Think and Grow Rich. And we document for you very simply that Napoleon Hill's inspiration came from demons. Now, he didn't call them demons. He called them masters of the temple of wisdom. 10,000-year-old, or I think he says 35,000-year-old beings, these masters from Hindu, uh, Hinduism, and they can dematerialize and came across the astral plane into his study and in a vibrant musical voice said to him, you've been under the guidance of the great school for years, and we have chosen you to give the formula of success to the world. And the formula of success literally given by demons to Napoleon Hill became the foundation of the entire positive mental attitude success motivation world out there that you will study as leading businessmen, as sales managers, and so forth. From demons, doctrines of demons from seducing spirits. And it comes into our churches because our elders and deacons and, and pew sitters are studying this sort of thing. And it works. Tremendous principles. Napoleon Hill is dead. The Napoleon Hill Foundation continues. It is headed by a man named W. Clement Stone, who was Napoleon Hill's partner in the founding, or rather in the writing, of success through a positive mental attitude. They coined the word positive mental attitude. They gave it to us. W. Clement Stone is the president of the Napoleon Hill Foundation. They continue to carry on this great tradition uh, to promulgate the teachings of Napoleon Hill, and every year they give uh, several golden, uh, gold medal Napoleon Hill awards. And to receive the gold medal Napoleon Hill award, you must give a public testimony of the benefits that you have received from these principles taught to Napoleon Hill. Of course, you don't say by the demons. And it's my understanding that a, a Southern Baptist University in Dallas is co-sponsoring the gold medal award this year, and it will be given to Robert Schuller. And of course, W. Clement Stone is on the international board of Robert Schuller Ministries. What is happening in our churches? Apostasy? I don't know how many Masons we have here tonight. This is the New Age magazine. Are you aware that the official organ for Scottish Rite Freemasonry, southeastern jurisdiction, is called the New Age magazine? 
It has been called that for many years. This issue, May 1986, happens to, you can't see it, it's a poor Xerox copy, but it happens to have on the cover Norman Vincent Peale, who tells that he is a 33rd degree Mason, he's been a Mason for about 60 years, and he gives a testimony in here to how wonderful Masonry is. Now, if you're a Mason here tonight, and I know there are a lot of Southern Baptists who are Masons and very sincere people, I've talked to them who say, well, I'm in the Blue Lodge, and, and uh, uh, it's, it's really a Christian organization, or some of them will say it's not a religious organization, Get out your morals and dogma by Albert Pike, and he will tell you that those in the Blue Lodge are deliberately deceived into thinking they know what masonry is about when they don't really know what it's about. And you only learn when you get into the little higher order. Now, if you've gotten as far as the degree of the Royal Arch and you're here tonight, you know I'm telling the truth. Sometimes people say to me, would you debate with the, grand, with the worshipful master of our lodge? And I say, why do you call him worshipful master? Yeah, I'd be happy to debate with him, but it would be a classic non-debate because he has taken, as every Mason here tonight knows, and every one of you has taken, he has taken an oath ever to conceal and never to reveal. So everything that I said Masons were involved in, which I know from former Masons, he would deny because he's taken an oath to deny it. And he has taken an oath that if he doesn't, he will have his throat slit from ear to ear, his heart torn out, he will be buried at low tide. And if you're a Mason here tonight, you couldn't even get inside the door until you took that oath. And any Christian confronted with an oath like that ought to run for the nearest exit as fast as he can. <clears throat> now, you don't get very far in Masonry. You get to the Royal Arts degree, and if you have gotten that far and you're Mason here tonight, you know I'm telling you the truth you received a secret name, and that name was Abaddon. Look it up in the book of Revelation, chapter 9, verse 11, or 11, verse 9, I forget which one it is, I think it's 9, 11. Abaddon is the leader of the hordes of hell. You're being led down the primrose path. But Norman Vincent Peale tells you that masonry begins in every mason's heart. He says, Although it doesn't promote any religious creed, all Masons believe in the deity. Yes, that's the G-A-O-T-U, the great architect of the universe, who is God as you conceive him to be. He can be a Buddhist God, he can be a Hindu God, he can be any God. However, Masonry makes no demands as to how a member thinks of the great architect of the universe. He says, though it's not a religion, it supplements faith in the Creator. You don't supplement faith in God. You turn people from God to something that is false. He says, as I travel, Freemasons notice my Masonic ring, which I always wear. With pride they say, I too am a Freemason. To me, Freemasonry is one form of dedication to God. How many forms of dedication to God are there? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. <clears throat> This is why Norman Vincent Peale on the Phil Donahue show said, you've got your way to God, I've got my way to God. And he said, I found eternal peace in a Shinto shrine. And it's not necessary to be born again, but he is honored highly as a Christian leader. I don't think that's right. He says, I am a Freemason in my heart, and so I will remain. Henry Clausen, 33rd degree, he's the head of Scottish Rite Freemasonry has written a book called The Emergence of the Mystical. Why don't you get it? I think it was published in 1981, you Masons. And get Henry Clausen's book, Emergence of the Mystical, and he tells you what Masonry has been all about is that the world is being prepared for the emergence of a new religion that will be a merger between Eastern mysticism, occultism, the Kabbalah, Hinduism, Buddhism, and science. Unfortunately, a belief in, that we must be scientific has come into the church of Jesus Christ. Can you believe that there are Christians who are telling you that God is subject to laws? This is Christian science. This is Mayan science. And that if we will learn these laws and learn how it works, we can do what God does. And Kenneth Copeland, in fact, says we have all the capabilities of God. And Kenneth Hagin says even non-Christians can make this work. In fact, in his little booklet, 
having faith in your faith, if I can find it here. Kenneth Hagin says, It used to bother me when I'd see unsaved people getting results, but my church members not getting results. Then it dawned on me what the sinners were doing. They were cooperating with this law of God, the law of faith. Sinners can cooperate with the law of faith. It's scientific, folks. All you have to do is understand how it works. And then he goes on and he says, God had faith in his faith. And God had faith, the previous page he says, God had faith in his words. And what you've got to do to have faith in your faith and faith in your words, say it out loud, faith in my faith. Keep saying it until it registers on your heart. I know it sounds strange when you first say it. Your mind almost rebels against it. Yes, your mind ought to rebel against it. But keep saying it, keep saying it. It's a form of brainwashing. Faith in my faith, faith in my faith, faith in my faith. God has faith in his faith. Faith has now become a power that God uses. And we can use this power also. And how does he use it? Well, faith is a power that's contained in words. And you, when you speak words, that releases this power. And they will quote verses such as, God said, let there be light, and there was light. God said, God said. They put the emphasis upon God said. See how the, the, where the right emphasis should be. Not God said, as though there's power in words, but God said. It happened because God said it. Because what God says will happen, will happen. <laughs> but they're teaching that there's a power in words. And if you learn how to speak words, in fact, in his little booklet, Words, Kenneth Hagin says, he mentions his two children who are in their 30s. He says, I haven't prayed for them more than a half a dozen times in their entire life. I haven't prayed for this. I didn't pray for that. Why haven't I? Because you can have what you say, and I had already said it. You don't have to pray. All you have to do is speak. Speak the word. And at the heart of this belief is the teaching that we are little gods. The Positive Confession movement was not founded by Kenneth Hagin. It was founded by a man named E.W. Kenyon. And E.W. Kenyon taught that we are little gods. And E.W. Kenyon, for a number of years, attended the Emerson School of Oratory in Boston in the 1890s, which was a hotbed of what was called New Thought, which we don't have time to go into, but you get the idea. The power is in your thinking. New Thought. It was thrown out of the church's heresy. It became science of mind, religious science, unity, and, and so forth. He dressed new thought up. He dressed science of mind up. And let me go back to this thing about science. The worst science is religious science. You cannot merge science and religion. You destroy both. Even a skeptic will say to you, Oh, you think that was a miracle? That wasn't a miracle because you just, I mean, you just didn't know the law that governed it. But if you understood the law and you could explain it scientifically, it's not a miracle, right? There's a book out there called The Secret Kingdom. And The Secret Kingdom runs on eight laws. And one of those laws is the law of miracles. And the author says God never does anything except according to the law of miracles. There is no such law. If a law governs it, it's not miracles, and you can do it by tapping into the power and scientifically applying it. You don't have to be the God of the universe. You can be any scientist. That's Christian science. That's not Christianity. I think that there are sincere Christians who are buying into this because they want something that they can make work. They want to get answers to their prayer. Prayer for most people who call themselves Christians, let's be truthful about it, is a religious technique for getting our own way. And we set our sights on what we want, and we spend the sweet hour of prayer trying to talk God into working it out for us. And if someone comes along and he offers a formula for getting this answer by what you think or what you speak or what you visualize, then we're very happy to tap into this thing. We quoted Michael Harner last night, an anthropologist, an expert on shamanism, witchcraft. And I quote it from page 136. And I want to finish that quote this evening. 
He said, the burgeoning field of holistic medicine shows a remarkable amount of experimentation with those techniques long practiced in shamanism, in witchcraft. But let's finish that quote, such as colon. And now he names five things that he says have been at the heart of witchcraft for thousands of years and now are the whole basis for the whole New Age movement. And you, as I speak them out to you, you will recognize that all five are now inside the church of Jesus Christ. Number one on his list, visualization. And we will spend an entire session on visualization because it's that important. Visualization is the most powerful form of occultism. Second on his list, psychotherapy. We'll spend a whole uh, session on psychology and Christian psychology, and we will tell you there is no such thing as Christian psychology. And I challenge anyone to refute that. Hip uh, visualization, psychotherapy, hypnotherapy, hundreds of Christian psychologists so-called practicing hypnosis on their patients. The fourth one on his list is the way he expresses it, positive expression for health and healing. That's positive confession. You speak it forth. And the fifth one on his list is positive thinking or positive mental attitude. All five within the church of Jesus Christ. These ideas are not only sweeping our society, they're coming into the church. Sincere people are believing them because they're being expressed by Christian leaders in whom they have great confidence. <clears throat> Norman Vincent Peale, New Magazine, plus the Magazine of Positive Thinking, the February issue, 1986, he says, prayer is the process by which you stimulate the deep subconscious insight you possess. Prayer, you tap into your unconscious powers, this human potential. C.S. Lovett, sincere evangelical pastor from Southern California says, faith is a direct line, is a, is a line that goes into your subconscious and releases these unconscious powers that you have. He said Jesus could command healings. He could speak healings on command because he had a direct line into the subconscious. He says, I know it sounds like mind science, but it's not really mind science. Yes, it is mind science in an evangelical form. We no longer have faith in God, but we have faith in the unconscious powers that lie within us. It's like a placebo. You know, it doesn't matter what God you believe in, what you call him, call him Buddha, call him Jesus, call him anything, but the whole thing is that by believing in something, you, this faith, this positive thinking, releases unconscious forces, not only within you, but in the cosmos. Norman Vincent Peale in The Power of Positive Thinking says, just as there is atomic power, so there is spiritual power. And just as there are scientific methods for tapping into the energy in the atom, so prayer is a religious technique for releasing spiritual power. You see, it works the same way. Anybody can do it. And Kenneth Hagin again in that booklet says, I wondered why non-Christians could do this. But then I realized that Jesus said, whosoever will say to this mountain, be thou removed. Well, why did he say whosoever? He didn't say just save people. He didn't just say Christians. He said whosoever. Why did he say that? because all men are spirit beings. And so all men, even non-Christians, can tap into these powers. Paul Yonggi Cho lays it out in the fourth dimension. He says, a line is one dimensional, a plane is two dimensional, the two includes the one, simple geometry. A cube is three dimensional, the three includes the two. Accurate so far. Now he takes a leap, neither warranted by logic, science, nor the Bible. He says the fourth dimension is spirit. You've got no basis for putting spirit in that kind of a physical uh, uh, dimensional relationship with this space-time continuum in which our physical bodies function. But having done that, following his analogy, he says the four includes the three. Now we've got a Hindu concept of God who is the all. He's everything. And because God is everything, he creates out of himself. 
and the universe is part of God. And how does he do it? He visualizes. And as that vision becomes real within him, it's like a hen hatching an egg. He incubates it and he gives it forth. And it manifests itself in the physical dimension. And then Paul Yonggi Cho says, Men are fourth dimension beings. Satan is fourth dimension. Demons and angels and God, they're all in the same dimension. You are not in God's dimension. You are not in God's class. He dwells in a dimension of his own. He dwells in a light that no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, who only hath immortality. God is totally other, and you are not in his class, but they're teaching that we're in his class. We're fourth dimension beings, and because we are, we can do what God does. It concerns me that it was the Holy Spirit, he says, that revealed this to him. And he says, he asked the Holy Spirit, how is it that the Soka Gakkai, the Nichiren Shoshu, some people here tonight have been involved in it, they chant Nam Myoho Renga Kyo, Nam Myoho Renga Kyo, and they create miracles. That's so their positive confession, releasing this power through words. And he asked God, how is it that these occultists, these non-Christians, can get miracles? And he says the Holy Spirit revealed to him it's because they're fourth dimension beings, just like God is and just like Christians are. And it's because they are developing the laws of the fourth dimension that they can create miracles. And Christians had better get into developing the laws of the fourth dimension. I think he's a very sincere man who loves the Lord, but I think he's been deceived. And I don't want you to be deceived. This is an idea that comes out of occultism. The power of the mind. This is Possibilities magazine, produced by Robert Schuller. The man on the cover is a leading businessman, a very prominent man, John Marks Templeton, money manager, with a heart of gold, it says. Yes, he's a philanthropist. Probably my concept of reality is the reason for my success, he's being asked. Over the years, I've been convinced that nothing exists except God. There is no other reality. Nothing exists except God. Well, if nothing exists except God, then we're all part of God. Then we're all God. Unfortunately, Norman Grubb, who was on the mission field in 1919 with C.T. Studd, an evangelical, a man who's written some marvelous books, now says there is only one person in the universe, that's God. And everything else is a manifestation of God in one of his many forms, including Satan. You can't say that nothing exists except God. He goes on and he says, well, the interviewer says, I understand you pray at your board meetings and often mention your faith in God. Yes, we pray for, an open, for, for wisdom, an open mind to do God's will. Certain spiritual principles attract prosperity to you, he says. He talks about being in tune with the infinite. These are mind science terms. He says, the Christ spirit dwells in every human being, whether the person knows it or not. That's a lie. That is not true. And yet this is in a magazine that goes out to evangelicals across America who highly acclaim the man who publishes this sort of thing. New wine, all about, and God said, putting the power of God in your words, an entire issue of this magazine. We are compromising with the world. We are picking up the ideas of the world. We're trying to do what E.W. Kenyon did. We're trying to make Christianity sound as much like mind science so the mind science occultists will accept it. And you will not take people to heaven that way. You will lead them to hell. They will mistake who God is. They have a false view of God, a false view of faith. It's very important that we have a, a, a proper comprehension of faith. We are saved by faith. By grace are you saved through faith. The just live by faith. Without faith it is impossible to please God. And if you're wrong on faith, you are seriously wrong. And I would state unequivocally tonight that the positive confession teaching and the power of positive thinking and the power of possibility thinking all presents a false concept of faith. 
where faith is a power of the mind that we can use to manipulate reality. And you can trace that right back to the occult. <clears throat> you say, but didn't Jesus say, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, be thou removed. Well, what is faith? We already said that. Is faith believing that what I'm praying for will happen because I believe it will happen? Or is faith in God? Faith must have an object. Have faith in God, Jesus said, Mark 11, 22. Well, then how could you dare say to a mountain, be thou removed, unless you knew it was God's will? And unless you knew when and where God wanted that to move? Unless you knew that you were God's chosen instrument? He hasn't turned his universe over to us to shuffle around with the power of our mind. If we can just believe it, it will happen. That will make it happen. That is not faith. That is occultism. That is an attempt on the part of man to play God. That takes people away from the true God. It takes people away from true faith, and it causes them to believe in themselves and in the power of the mind. That's not taking people to heaven. That's taking people to hell. And I'm very concerned that these teachings have come into the church of Jesus Christ. Here's a mountain right here. Well, if you just have faith like grain and mustard seed, you can say this mountain be there removed. We got Mr. A over here and Mr. B over here, and they both have faith like a grain of mustard seed, faith to move mountains. And Mr. A, the problem is, he wants to move the mountain in that direction, and Mr. B wants to move the mountain in that direction. Now, which way is it going to go? And Mr. A is claiming this verse, and he is believing, and claiming that it's going to move in this direction. Mr. B is confessing it has already moved in that direction. You just haven't seen it, but you keep confessing it, and it will be there. That mountain is going to move when and where God decides it's going to move. And if Mr. A is God's man of the hour, he will know it. And he won't be trying to get God to move that mountain or trying to get faith to move it. There was a man way back in the early 1800s named George Mueller, man of faith. I think we could stack George Mueller up against Kenneth Hagin or Kenneth Copeland or Oral Roberts or anybody today. His diary contains thousands of specific answers to prayer. He cared for thousands of orphans whom he fed and clothed and housed. And he had a rule in his life. He didn't put it on other people. He never asked anyone for a dime. He never told anybody that he needed anything. He only told God, and he wanted his life to be a testimony that there's a God who hears and answers prayer. People used to say, Brother Mueller, you must be a man of great faith. He would say, no, I'm a man of very little faith but it's in a great God. It's God who does it. It's God who does it, not faith. I believe that we need correction in the church of Jesus Christ. I believe we desperately need correction. People say, judge not, lest you be judged. Jesus told us to judge them by their fruits. How are you going to judge them by their fruits if you don't judge? When Jesus said, judge not, he meant don't judge their hearts, don't judge their motives. But we must judge their doctrines. First, First Corinthians 14, 29 says, let the prophets speak and let the others judge. Who is judging what comes out over Christian television? I have spoken to some of these people at their, at their organizational gatherings, national religious broadcasters, for example, and said to the television and radio people, supposing Hymenaeus and Philetus were alive today, Hymenaeus and Philetus were named by Paul. He said, Hymenaeus and Philetus concerning the truth have erred, teaching that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. What would you do if Hymenaeus and Philetus were alive today and had a huge international television ministry and they weren't overthrowing the faith of some, they were overthrowing the faith of millions? How do you police your ranks? Absolute silence, they don't police their ranks. And if you write a book calling into question and calling into account the teachings of some of these men and pointing out how it is not according to the scripture, then they cry, division, you're causing division. And they don't want to be questioned. They don't want to police their ranks and they're scrambling for unity based upon not the unity of the faith and the, the, for which we must earnestly contend or the unity of the spirit who is the spirit of truth who leads us into all truth, but a unity based upon agreeing not to disagree with one another. And five people, I don't even have to name them for you, control the major Christian television networks. And they have taken control of vast properties bought with the sacrificial giving of millions of Christians, and they have set themselves up as the sole proprietors, as though they own this. They own these networks, 
and you can't get correction to them, they decide what comes over. And let me tell you what comes over. It's not mainstream Christianity. It's what Chuck Smith calls charismania. It's not even mainstream charismatic teaching or Pentecostal teaching. The Assemblies of God, the largest Pentecostal church, has a position paper written against positive confession and the rhema teaching, which is mainly what you're getting over the Christian television networks. I don't know of a major Christian denomination that accepts this. And I have sympathy for pastors. I don't see how you can correct in a half an hour on Sunday morning the, the heresy that has been taught on television in, pouring out into, into uh, living rooms all week long. And part of that heresy at the heart of Kenneth uh, Hagen and Kenneth Copeland and Charles Capps and these men that comes from E.W. Kenyon was that Jesus had to die spiritually. That our redemption was not complete, although Jesus from the cross cried, it is finished. Kenneth Copeland says redemption began at the cross. And he says when the blood of Jesus was shed, that did not redeem us. Our redemption comes through Jesus taking on the nature of Satan, sinking into hell as a helpless, hopeless, sinful man and being tortured by Satan for three days and three nights and being born again out of the depths of hell, the first born again man. This is the teaching of the positive confession movement. I think it's heretical teaching. I think it's teaching against which the church of Jesus Christ ought to say, no, we will not stand for it. At least allow someone who believes something else to come on your networks and to confront these people and to teach something else. I think we desperately need what Paul wrote to Timothy about. He said, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. And part of the problem is our teaching about the cross. We are self-indulgent. A recent article in Moody Magazine titled Before the Altar of I begins like this. A new hybrid faith is infiltrating evangelicalism. Self is at its center. While in most quarters its creed is still orthodox, its conclusions are humanistic, but in the hands of some promoters of selfism, traditional Christian doctrine is already crumbling. A.W. Tozer wrote some years ago, he said, if I see aright, the cross of popular evangelicalism is not the cross of the New Testament. It is rather a new bright ornament upon the bosom of a self-assured and carnal Christianity. The old cross slew men. The new cross entertains them. I would have to say that Christian television, much of it, it's painfully clear. It's very shallow. You'd have to call it show biz. It's frothy. It entertains. Instead of self-denial, it offers self-acceptance, self-love, and self-esteem. It's no longer the instrument of death. But as Robert Schuller says, the cross sanctifies the ego trip. And he says, Christ endured the cross to sanctify your self-esteem. And he endured the cross to sanctify his self-esteem. A.W. Tozer says, the old cross slew men, the new cross entertains them. The old cross condemned, the new cross amuses. The old cross destroyed confidence in the flesh. The new cross encourages it. The flesh, smiling and confident, preaches and sings about the cross. Before that cross it bows, and toward that cross it points with carefully staged histrionics, but upon that cross it will not die, and the reproach of the cross it stubbornly refuses to bear. Let's read about faith. By faith, Moses, <clears throat> when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer prosperity with the people of God choosing rather to suffer what? Affliction. When did you last hear that preached on mainstream Christian television? Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God. You know, I've traveled behind the Iron Curtain and I can tell you that some of those Christians over there pray for us in America. They wonder, what is wrong with the Christianity in America that is so popular? The Christianity we have over here is that macho quarterback who threw that winning touchdown pass in the Super Bowl in the last three seconds. And he's a real macho guy. And wow, isn't that fabulous? We can be Christians and hold our heads up in society. And we can be successful because Christ will give you everything the world wants. But you got heaven too. He'll sanctify all of the selfish desires and he'll give it to you. 
I don't think that's Christianity. And it says, by faith, Moses, <clears throat> he chose, uh, he esteemed, verse 26, the reproach of Christ, greater riches than all the treasures of Egypt. He could have had all the treasure, all the success, all the prosperity, all the wealth of Egypt, and he turned his back on it, and there was something else that he esteemed higher. What was it? The reproach of Christ. The reproach of Christ. But we're trying to make Christ popular. The Word of God says that the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who perish. And we're trying to make the gospel make sense. It doesn't make sense until you change your mind and the Holy Spirit changes your heart and you surrender your will to Him. Then it makes sense to those of us who are saved it's the wisdom of God, but to those who perish it's foolishness and we're trying to make it sound sensible to those who are perishing. And we're destroying it. Now he goes on, he talks about who through faith, verse 33, subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens, women received their dead, raised to life again. You say, wow, that's terrific, brother. That's victory. That's Christianity. Man, that's success and blessing. That's the kind of teaching we want to hear. Yeah, but let's go on and read the rest of it. And others were tortured not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, bonds, imprisonments. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder. They were tempted, were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. These poor people didn't know how to make a positive confession. They should have confessed a jaguar and a condominium or whatever. No, they're the heroes of the faith. It says, of whom the world was not worthy, and they died in faith. I'm not trying to preach defeat. I'm trying to preach the cross. I'm trying to preach the truth and submission to the will of God. I think we need to get back to a biblical Christianity where we don't try to use God and try to play God, but where we surrender our hearts to Him and allow Him to have His way in our lives, according to the Word of God and according to the leading of His Holy Spirit.